The NATO summit in Vilnius was toted as a summit of superlatives, showing unity and strength. But how united is the alliance really? There have been doubts about that lately. NATO wants to be prepared to counter the new main enemy, Russia. More money, more soldiers and more weapons. The alliance also wants to continue growing. Sweden will now join. And Ukraine? Well, perhaps one day. That was disappointing for Zelensky, but at least he will receive more hardware, including controversial weapons like cluster munitions. This is meant to ensure the Ukrainian counteroffensive will succeed. We ask, NATO and the war, no security for Ukraine. I'm Gerhard Elfes. Welcome to To The Point. Uh, let me introduce today's panel. Suda David Wilp, director of the Berlin office of the German Marshall Fund. Alexander Gabuyev, director of the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center, it's a think tank. And Markus Koip, chair of defense economics at the Military Academy at ETH Zurich. A warm welcome to all of you. Let me start with you, Suda. That summit that just finished uh, in Vilnius, the NATO summit, was it a success and if so, for whom? I think the summit can be categorized as a success for a number of reasons. One, there was unity among the 31 member states in terms of having Ukraine eventually join as a member. Um, there was a realization that 2% should be a floor rather than a ceiling. All the members understand that investment in NATO is necessary. There was also um, plans, it was acknowledged that defense plans for Europe, um, for defending the continent, were in place. So for all those reasons, I think you can call the NATO summit a success, especially if you see it as more of an interim step or a bridge um, to the next summit in Washington when NATO celebrates a milestone anniversary. Not so much a success for, for uh, Zelensky, would you agree? Well, not necessarily. I think a great success is that the membership action plan was waived. Um, because that, if implemented, um, would, would certainly mean a number of, of years on top um, of, of what we already have. In Let me just explain this. This yeah. is a, a simplified, uh, more speedy access to, to yes, NATO. Yes, it's, it's exactly it? the same what, what uh, NATO did with Finland's and Sweden's um, uh, attempts to, to join, um, waiving the, the membership action plan. Um, I mean, it, there are examples in, in, uh, in NATO members. Uh, take, for example, Croatia, Albania or Northern Macedonia, where that accession period took years or even decades. And the, the, the simple fact that it will be waived for Ukraine, and that means probably that Ukraine will be ready to join NATO as soon as militaries on Western standards and as soon as certain institutional reforms have been passed, and so, of course as soon as the war is over. But once that happens, um, th there are no more subterfuges and no more arguments why Ukraine should not join NATO. And I think that is a great success for the Ukrainian side. Alexander, how is this being viewed in, in Russia, you think? I think that the fact that Ukraine will not be admitted to NATO this time was quite expected. President Biden was very clear-cut. Is, is that a success for Moscow? I think that's something that's already baked in in the Kremlin's expectations that, well, Ukraine will not <clears throat> enter NATO just now because President Biden said that he's not bringing the U.S. and NATO to war with Russia over Ukraine. But the fact that Ukraine has received commitments for prolonged investment in its defense capacity, including building up the Ukrainian military industry and provision of weapons long term, I think that's something that worries the Kremlin. But the Kremlin hopes that this will be remaining in statements and pieces of paper. And then if Donald Trump is in the White House, if there is a different leadership in major European countries, probably these promises will be futile and will go away. Mm. So uh, it has been touted that the fact that the US and Germany, especially the US, have been standing on the brakes with regard to proper membership, NATO membership for, for Ukraine. Uh, the reason for that being that they still want, the US still wants NATO membership as a bargaining chip with Russia after a ceasefire. Do you agree? We have zero 
evidence to support this. And I think that Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, was on the record saying that that's not the case, that yes, there are channels of communication to the Russians about de-risking and about milit preventing military incidents going out of hand. But it's not, not about discussing Ukraine's future without Ukraine. And again, I think that this is groundless, really. And I would also would say that there is no reason to believe that Russia will have a say in Ukraine's future. Uh, to me, the, the only realistic goal in this war is the restitution of Ukraine in its borders, in its 1991 borders, that includes Crimea. And I think it was the, the great fault of European policy to be too much influenced by these so-called red lines or these so-called Russian security interests. There are no such interests. We have the world order of 1945, and that means we have sovereign states against which no aggression is tolerated. Mm. And the sooner we return to that world order, the better for the world as such. Stoltenberg downplayed this membership issue uh, and said it, the main thing was more weapons for Ukraine. That's the top priority. Do, would you agree? Is that, is that a reasonable point of view? I mean, absolutely. I think, um, you know... President Zelensky should be happy that not only short-term security guarantees were issued, but also long-term. And um, talk of sort of having the Israeli model uh, apply to Ukraine is also very beneficial. Um, look at the relationship between... Israeli model means a special security partnership? Meaning that, like, you know, the sovereignty and security of Israel should be upheld. Now, certainly, it's not a perfect um, analogy since Israel is known to have nuclear weapons. But nonetheless, the United States is a strong supporter and ally of Israel. And if, if the President Biden equates Ukraine with Israel, that could only be a good thing. And I don't think President Zelensky necessarily um, expected automatic membership into NATO at this summit. What he was looking for was perhaps stronger language and also an invitation. But I think um, at the end, he also realized realized, um, you know, rather than being sort of sour grapes on the first day, he did change his tone and said that he was very grateful for all the support. The U.S. has supplied nearly $40 billion in military assistance since last February, and Europe has also stepped up. So I think there is across-the-board agreement that Ukraine should be a member of NATO. It's just a question of when the right window of opportunity will arise. Mm. Ukraine as a member of NATO, that NATO membership, that is Russia's security nightmare, a scenario that Putin desperately wanted to avoid. Actually, one of the reasons he started his war against Ukraine in the first place. Now, is that fear justified and how serious is the perceived threat to Russia? Over one million Ukrainians are currently fighting against Russia. In peacetime, Ukraine's army is 200,000 strong. Those troops would be added to NATO's current number of 3.3 million active soldiers. The Ukrainian army, trained and armed by the West, could become one of the best in the defense of alliance after the war is over. NATO territory, which expanded significantly to the east after the Cold War, would continue to grow on the Russian border if Ukraine were added. It is the second largest European country after Russia. Seven NATO countries would then be direct neighbors with Russia. The common border would be extended by almost 2,000 kilometers to around 4,500. This would be the worst case scenario from the Russian perspective, as NATO soldiers could be stationed on Ukrainian soil and NATO military bases set up there. Ukraine as a NATO member. How would Russia respond? And we could have that situation uh, sooner than many uh, may think. Uh, you have said, uh, Marcus, that uh, by October, this October, 2023, the war in Ukraine will be over. Not exactly. I have said it will be strategically lost for Russia, and that is a different thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that combat will end in October, but we will have a situation where Russia, the attrition of the Rus Russian armed forces is so great that Putin will have to think about whether it makes sense from a rational point of view to continue this war. Mm. And I think that is, that is the very strategic blunder that now clearly shows. I mean, he could have had it all. And Zelensky, even after the war had started, even in March 22, before the Butcher and Irpin massacres were publicly known, had offered 
well, we could end the war now and we could become, as, as Ukraine, as, as a, we could become a neutral country and we could uh, forego our aspirations to ever become a membership. Now, Putin had the chance to have less NATO and now he's got more NATO. Mm. And no one but himself is to blame for this and no one but himself is to blame for the aggression, for the attrition of the Russian army, for all the dead soldiers and civilians. And I think that is a perspective that is lost among many and that that is a great fault in many Western discussions. We believe arming Ukraine would mean to prolong the war. It's the opposite. Mm. The sooner we stop this war, the better for the world. I mean, that's uh, without a doubt true. But do you agree, Alexander? I agree that definitely it's major miscalculation and a crime from moral point for sure, but also strategically for Russia, because NATO was not threatening. Russia is a, has a nuclear deterrent. Russia used to have a very strong conventional army. We will find out whether it's a stronger conventional capability or weaker when and if the war is over in the next years. But I think that till October 23, Russia still has capacity to go on. I think that Russia produces a lot of material. Yes, it's inferior compared to Western equipment that Ukraine is getting, but Western military industrial base needs to get up to speed to deliver everything that Ukraine needs, where Russia is working just for this war. And then there is also ability to bring more people to the front line. Russia has brought around 250,000 people in Kavolis, General Kavolis estimate, that's the supreme commander of NATO in Europe, uh, over the last wave of mobilization. Now Russia has a lot of legislations in place that could allow them to do this clandestine stealth mobilization without announcing this, without creating a public popular pushback, but also bring into the front lines to die thousands of men. Strategically, it's lost, mm. for sure. It's NATO expansion, it's Ukraine lost forever, and animosity running for generations. But tactically, unfortunately, this war and hostilities can continue for some years, for sure. Uh, it well, could also be, yeah. if Putin is in denial about the fact that he has lost uh, uh, the war, um, this could go yeah. on, as uh, Senator said. We, we, we could now have a very boring discussion about attrition rates, um, about mm -hmm. how fast the Russian army is going down at the moment. 4.5 tanks per day, six infantry fighting vehicles per day. Uh, they were, their artillery is attrited enormously at this time. And I don't believe that whatever the Russian army is doing right now in Ukraine is in any way sustainable. Mm -hmm. And if you just extrapolate the attrition rates into the future, um, it's, it's pretty obvious what will happen from a military point of view. I, I'm not very interested in all the political dialogue that, that accompanies all of that. But I believe that Putin was misinformed or at least ill-informed when he started his war. I think he massively exaggerated and overestimated his military capabilities. He was unaware of all the infighting and the factions um, that it now exists in the Russian army. And we have to really um, be aware of the fact that today's Russian army is not the Red Army. It's not the Soviet army of the 1980s. It's something completely mm. different. And what, what strikes me, really, is, is the, the lack of a capability to adapt, the lack of, of, of learning, of lessons learned. They keep making the same mistakes. The attrition rate is not going down. It's stable for months now. And, um, well, if, if you take the discussion from that point of view, um, it's, it's a simple fact of logistics. The war is not won by, well, it's also won, of course, by bravery and, and by battles, but it's primarily won by logistics. Mm. And that is my perspective on things. Suda, um, having heard uh, all of this, do you think that Vladimir Putin, once he realizes that he cannot gain anymore, <clears throat> that he will stop the war? Is that realistic? So, I mean, I think... Alexander would be a better interlocutor for that question. But I can tell you that, of course, Putin still has supporters in China, Iran. But, you know, there's also um, signs of change. Look at Turkey, for example. Turkey was open to um, Swedish membership and to NATO, um, let Ukrainian um, soldiers go home, um, and has also seems to now sort of and has agreed to NATO membership for Ukraine. So I think there are positive signs as well. So it may be a question of, as Marco says, attrition, but also how um, much longer can um, Putin also have the sway over sort of these countries that are swing states like India, like China, in terms of support for his war. Mm.
Now, um, let me come to uh, the help that uh, uh, Ukraine again is getting. Uh, more help is, is on the way. Germany is helping Ukraine uh, with weapons, but it can hardly afford to do so. The country is suffering from decades of underinvestment in its own armed forces because the Cold War was over, wasn't it? that backfires now, but under pressure from NATO, Germany is finally and reluctantly ramping up its defense spending. But could it be too little, too late? Germany's Bundeswehr has been tightening its belt for years. Now it is having to continuously replace the arms being donated to Ukraine. It has to remain a fully equipped operational and combative army, also to defend the alliance. Despite austerity measures, Germany's defense budget has grown by 1.7 billion to almost 52 billion euros. But that is still not the 2% of economic output it pledged to NATO. The difference is meant to come from the German government's 100 billion euro special fund intended for large armament projects, such as the F-35 stealth jet. Germany has also promised NATO a division of 15,000 soldiers in 2025. But their readiness will only be managed to a limited extent, according to an internal document from March of this year. Germany's defense minister Boris Pistorius also surprised the Bundeswehr with another announcement. 4,000 troops are to be permanently stationed in Lithuania to secure NATO's eastern flank. Experts say that will be an enormous effort. Change in the Bundeswehr. But can Germany fulfill its promises? That's the question that we want to ask. Let's start with the 4,000 soldiers uh, uh, to the eastern flank. Would that make a difference? Well, it sounds like a lot. I would say it's a first little water drop. It's not even uh, a division, is it? No, it's, it's not. But you have to start somewhere. I mean, you, you said um, just, just before we, we heard this, uh, this little um, video sequence that the Cold War was over. I'm not so sure. Probably it has well, just paused. Well, we thought it was. Yeah, but probably has, it has just paused for 33 years because we still have to deal with an imperial Russia um, whose motives are clearly um, geared towards um, a, a, what, what Russia believes to be its sphere of influence. And as long as that thinking is present in, in Russian politics, um, we have to think about how to handle this. And the weakness of European policy over the last three decades was to, well, to accommodate that Russian thinking. Um, look at what, what, what Europe did after 2014, nothing. And then in 2015, we had the Minsk Accords, which basically, well, was, we could say, was sort of a present for Russia. Russian aggression was not confronted, it was tolerated and it was made permanent, and it certainly enabled the full invasion of 2022. And I think that is now the great turning point in European policy. But you, you also see the long, long way you will have to go until you have something like we had in the 1980s. Um, European armies that are not only strong, but also capable. And I mean, that, that's the point to me. Um, it's just not enough to pour more money into a system that is not effective. Mm. Um, the Western European armies have to go a fundamental process, uh, to undergo a fundamental process of transformation. And that will take a lot of time. Mm. Poland understands that now. I'm not so sure about Germany. That might, that's my next question. I saw you nodding a lot. Yes. So with regard to Germany, what do you say to that? I mean, I tend to agree with Marcus in the sense that it's not just about money. And Germany, I don't think, can wiggle its way out of um, the 2% commitment at this point. Even though um, it's going to have to confront it soon, the special military fund will cover it for a little while, but there has to be, you know, obviously in the permanent budget, an increase in terms of military spending um, and not just for sort of human resources. But I think more importantly is that a strategic culture needs to um, be in place in terms of being more efficient, not having inhibitions about having a strong um, military industry. Um, so that means uh, the private sector it needs to work hand in hand with the government but that is occurring the so-called turning um, point in germany is i think in policy circles is being embraced by the mainstream parties it's now just a matter of um, the um, citizens also realizing that harsh strategic choices will have to take place when it comes to spending and sort of the good years of just um, you know um, doling out money will not be um, present in the near future but do you think that, that Russia will be impressed by uh, 
the announcements of more money being put into the armed forces in NATO countries. I mean, this is only 11 of the 31 NATO members actually reach this 2%. Uh, uh, threshold. I think that Russia Russia believes that NATO is the US. So if we look at the 16 plus month of this conflict, Russia has never touched something that's covered by Article 5. Like Russia Mm -hmm. knows that NATO has teeth, that these are American teeth predominantly, and nothing really has happened. Well, Russia tried on the margins with cyber domain and stuff, but was not very successful. So unfortunately, it falls on Ukraine, where Russia will not be impressed. I would say, I'm not packing and going home. Like, I'm going to destroy this country. And unfortunately, that's now Putin's plan to make Ukraine unlivable, destroyed, deny its territorial integrity, and deny the ability to reconstruct and for the people who are left, who have left the country to return back home. That's the plan now. Would you agree? Well, I would say it's, it's certainly the, the, the last resort measure um, that, that Russia can take now. Um, there is, an, I would say, an imperial motive in that policy. What Russia cannot have, Russia destroys. And you, you clearly see that in all the war crimes that have been committed so far in the systematic destruction of energy, of electricity infrastructure, um, systematic destruction of the conditions of living. And all of these are war crimes, of course. Um, but I don't think it will break Ukraine. I, I think it will make Ukraine harder and stronger after the war. And we will have a very different Ukraine, a Slavic country that is pro-Western, that is armed to the teeth, and that will act as some sort of greater West Berlin. Um, Some, well, I would say some window um, that portrays um, to the Russian side, look, this is what every Slavic nation could become. Uh, This is the well, in, in a way, the exact opposite of what you have in Russia. This is a positive image for the future and one that is defended, one that has teeth, one that will not be invaded again. And now guess what that will do to Russian internal policy. And I think that that's probably a a longer term motive that Mm. is also in this war. Many people talk about so-called values that are now being defended. I'm not so sure. Ukraine fights now for its territorial integrity, for its sovereignty, for its survival. Mm. And that I think is a very strong motive that unites a nation and probably creates a new a new sort of, of nation. I think it's, it's very similar to, to great independence wars we had in, in history. You uh, just mentioned what a strong Ukraine, firmly attached to the West, maybe even a member of NATO. What will that do to, to uh, internal Russian, Russian politics? What would you say to that? I think that Ukraine will be very anti-Russian for generations for understandable reasons after all of the war crimes commitment. There will be no easy reconciliation because the reconciliation between Poland and Germany was achieved through complete defeat and unconditional surrender. Mm. It's very hard for me to see Ukrainian or NATO flag to be put on the Red Square. So even if Russia doesn't achieve its strategic goals in Ukraine and doesn't break it, so Ukraine stands and even regains territorial integrity, we have examples like Saddam Hussein who lost his war against Iran, who then tried to invade Kuwait and was pushed back. And then it took 13 years and a full-blown US invasion to take him out. So even if Russia loses in Ukraine, the regime itself might be preserved and become really bitter, understanding that we didn't succeed because of the West. So I don't think that there will be a trend line for liberalization. They might, but I think that the window of opportunity is very tiny little. So the uh, architecture, the security architecture of Europe is shifting to the east uh, uh, with this. What kind of consequences does that have for the rest of Europe, for the, the traditional base of, let's say, NATO with, like, uh, sure. with, with Germany and Britain? I mean, I think we talked about how uh, more troops are needed on the eastern flank, and I think that's another reason why there was also a pause in terms of admitting Ukraine, because at this moment in time, I think Washington understands that if... Um, that were to happen, more troops would be necessary on the eastern flank, and it would be the United States that would send its blood and treasure. So the hope is that in the near future, Europe can build up its defense capabilities to to be um, a, a strong actor conventionally, 
as the United States also looks at challenges in the Indo-Pacific. So I think that needs to happen. Um, it's wonderful that there has been NATO cohesion um, this past year with the war against Ukraine. And I think everybody agrees that Ukraine will make NATO stronger, make the values that undergird the West stronger because it's fighting for those values. I actually think they are values embedded in the UN Charter and um, they're fighting for democratic values. So um, I do think that um, in the short term, uh, Europe does need to increase its military capabilities so the United States could also look to um, challenges in the Indo-Pacific. Mm. Uh, before we come to an end, I would like to uh, get your opinion uh, on this uh, war possibly being finished by uh, the end of the year, let's uh, put it that way. How realistic is that? Very briefly, please. Um, I, I'm not a military expert, so I wouldn't know. But if that were to happen, I think that would be good for U.S. Uh, politics going into an election year. Marcus. It would be strategically lost, but combat would probably go on for a number of months. But it will not change the end result. The end result is a free and sovereign Ukraine in the borders of 91. I would believe that, unfortunately, this is a long war that we are facing. Thank you very much to my panel. That was today's edition of To The Point. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. Let us know what you think down here in the comments if you, happening to, if you happen to watch us on YouTube. We're keen to hear from you. And for now, from me and the team, thanks for watching.